Guadalupe Mountains National Park has eight of the 10 tallest peaks in all of Texas. And that mountain behind me, Guadalupe Mountain, is the tallest at 8,800 feet. But let's be honest, if you like adventure, it's probably not the most epic peak you'll ever climb. However, even the most impressive peaks worldwide, like Everest, the Alps, all share one important feature with this relatively modest Texas range. They're all mountains. Okay, yes, but maybe something like a little more interesting for the people. Oh, you mean that you can find marine fossils way up high, thousands of feet above sea level in all these locations? Yes, exactly. And how these fossils ended up at the top of mountains all over the world, far away from any body of water, is explained by one of the most important and revolutionary concepts in all of Earth science. We're talking about plate tectonics, people. He loves plate tectonics, what can I say? So today, we're going on an adventure through time and space to visit the Permian, West Texas, maybe a stop in 19th century Germany to learn all about the history and evidence for plate tectonics. It's a lot, so we better get started. Let's go! This is my plate tectonics dance. Let's shift like plates. The greatest scientists and thinkers of our age have asked questions like, what makes mountains? Why fossils end up in places and patterns we find them? And why the continents really seem like they should fit together? Plate tectonics helps explain all of it, and it's one of the most important concepts in Earth science from the past 100 years. And the Guadalupe Mountains provide a delightful example of this theory, if you know a little about how this area formed. So that's where we're gonna start. Actually, not here. We're going to start in the Permian about 260 million years ago. Well, there's a lot of fantastic things to know about this period. The two particularly notable facts about the Permian are, one, that it ended in the largest mass extinction ever seen on our planet, and two, it was the heyday of Pangaea, a time when the world land masses were all joined together in a single continent that spread from the north to the south pole, while the rest of the Earth was covered in a giant ocean. The idea of this supercontinent Pangaea was first proposed by a German scientist named Alfred Wegener. More about him in a bit. Let's stick with the West Texas for now. During the Permian period, the area we currently call New Mexico in Texas was on the western edge of that megacontinent Pangaea, just south of the equator surrounded by that massive ocean. This corner of West Texas, called the Permian Basin, is currently almost entirely desert, the Chihuahuan Desert to be specific. But 260 million years ago, it was covered by an inland sea that connected to the super ocean by a narrow little inlet that brought in water. This is important because at the end of that inland sea, our international Permian era superstar was born, a giant reef called the Capitan Reef. Here in Guadalupe National Park, we are in the bottom of a Permian reef. The Permian period was the period before the Triassic period. The reef is like a kind of like a fish city and I have like a fossil that kind of looks like a shell. See that? It kind of looks like a shell. And so this whole area used to be a Permian reef. It used to be underwater. At this rate, this rain is going to turn it back into an ocean so we better hike this trail and enjoy it. Mostly made of sponges and algae, the Capitan Reef was huge and likely thriving for millions of years until the narrow channel that connected the inland sea to the large ocean was cut off. The basin filled in with sediment and that buried the reef. Most of the fossil reef remains buried today. Kai fun fact time! Kai fun fact time! Carlsbad cavern formed from the same reef. So what you see underground in the caves at Carlsbad is the same reef as you see above ground in Guadalupe Mountain. Let's talk about how that reef, 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 reef. I don't know, it doesn't sound right to me when reef. I say it out loud. Reef, <laughs> reef. You said it correctly. Did I? Okay. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about how that reef eventually became unearthed. Fast forward to about 80 million years ago and tectonic forces along the western edge of North America, the same forces that helped create the amazing Rocky Mountains, pushed and fall to the land, causing a buried chunk of the Capitan Reef to rise up. Now exposed to the elements like wind and rain, the softer layers on this lifted area melt away, revealing the more resilient limestone fossil underneath. Ta-da! El Capitan and the Guadalupe Mountains are born. No plate tectonics, no Guadalupe Mountains. Or really any mountains of that. Plate tectonics. <laughs> and yet the theory of plate tectonics is actually a very recent idea in scientific thinking that took a really long time in development. Here's how it got started. 
If you looked at a map of the world without knowing anything about geology or paleontology or any other ology, you might very easily think, hey, these land masses look like they fit together like a puzzle. It turns out the very idea had been occurring to humans basically from the moment they started making maps of the world that included the Americas in the early 1500s. Hundreds of years before any idea, an organized theory of continental drift or plate tectonics existed. For example, in 1596, the Dutch mapmaker Abraham Ortelius suggested that the Americas were torn away from Europe and Africa by earthquakes and floods. You see, back then, the mechanism of continental separation was believed to be more catastrophic in nature, often focused around the idea of a flood, maybe even a biblical flood. And that idea held for a few hundred years. For example, in 1658, the French monk Francois Placet published a book entitled The Breakup of Large and Small Worlds as being demonstrated that America was connected before the flood with other parts of the world. Which is one heck of a long title for a short book. In that pamphlet, he argued that the continents were connected by the lost continent of Atlantis, and it was the destructive currents of the biblical flood that separated them. But in the mid-1800s, the evidence supporting the idea that the continents were once joined moved from the geometrical to the geological. In 1858, Antonio Snyder Pellegrini published his book, The Creation and Its Mysteries Unveiled, in which he appears to be one of the first individuals to propose an idea of continental drift based on the observation that you could find identical fossils in Europe as you could across the Atlantic in the United States. He even gave us the first diagram of what these merged continents might have looked like. And throughout the 19th century, we see this kernel of an idea proposed by Snyder Pellegrini developed and debated. Until we got to 1912, when Alfred Wegener was the first to fully articulate the idea of continental drift. And it was this same Wegener that proposed the idea that continents used to be compressed into a single supercontinent he called Pangaea, and over time they drifted into their current positions. And while Wagner drew from a stunning variety of paleontological and geological evidence to support this idea, the only thing he couldn't explain was how the continents moved. This ended up being a fatal flaw to his otherwise fantastic ideas. Wegener sort of weakly suggested that maybe the continents just plowed through the ocean floor, which really didn't make much sense, and frankly, none of his other mechanisms of action that he suggested and tried to develop took hold either. So his theory was debated for a while, but eventually, around 1929, it was pretty much dismissed. This is also around the time Wegener died on a trip to explore Greenland. But not all was lost because at the same time, another scientist, Arthur Holmes, took one of Wegener's hypotheses that the mantle experiences thermal convection and then developed this as the mechanism for continental movement. Promising start to supporting the theory of continental drift. But again, no one really took notice. <sighs> Science is like so exhausting sometimes. Exhausting. Finally, around the 1950s, we had better tools to study the seafloor, magnetometers adapted from technology developed during World War II, and improved seismographs. All of which finally, finally, finally provided evidence supporting the idea that the lithosphere is in motion and has been over geologic time. Evidence is supporting and giving rise to the modern theory of plate tectonics that today help us explain exactly why we find marine fossils at the highest peaks around the world, and helping us understand just how the Guadalupe Mountains and their fantastic Permian reefs form in the first place. But that reef isn't the only amazing thing about the Permian Basin. Ooh, foreshadowing.